to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It feels like forever since I've been up here for opening prayer. Uh, my family has relished your prayers and your encouragement um, through the difficulties of this past month. I would like to start off this morning with a plea to my brothers and sisters that we are in mighty need for workers for the harvest. Our youth clubs are starting up. We have Wednesday night wave runners. We've got Olympians and Gophers. We've got Doc uh, teen youth group on Sunday nights. We've got Dig and Deeper teen Bible study on Wednesday nights. Many hands make light work. I'll be at the table back there with all of our stuff, all of our signups. I'll be there to answer questions. I'll be there to hopefully convince you that you should come along and join us in this ripe, ripe harvest. Um, so see me after service back at that table. And also see me after service back at that table. If you don't know me, there are many new faces this morning. Praise the Lord. I would like to get to know more of my family. So please uh, see me at the back table, and we have a little something for you as well. As we uh, continue in our worship, we're going to be worshiping through um, a quick reading of God's word, and then I'll open in prayer. It'll be in Psalm 25, 1 through 5. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, all of this is for you. I pray that this hour of worship is glorifying and honoring to you. I pray that you are the focus of everything we say, do, sing, think, not only during this time, but as we go on this side of heaven through our lives. Lord, you lay the path. May we be wise and obedient in following it. Your grace is sufficient, and on this day of worship, we know that this is your day, this is your church, these are your words that we need desperately more and more each day. Help us be students of the word, help us pant after your commandments, for you are our master. Please give us the scraps from your table as we serve you as best as we can. And it's not always easy and sunshine and rainbows. It's a walk. Some days it's a crawl. But as long as we have you leading the way on that path, then we can crawl with joy in our hearts because your strength is our joy. Your grace is our joy. Your son is our joy. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We can face today. And we can face every minute of this walk on earth. May you be glorified this morning and the rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet each other this morning. remain standing as we continue in worship this morning with just a closer walk with me. Keep me from all wrong. 
We're going to be studying this morning about the fruits of the Spirit and completing the I am who you say I am, a closer walk with thee. If you look at this list that's coming up, we talked about the fruits of the flesh and the works of the flesh in following weeks, and I find myself far too often falling into that category. And this encouragement that I have to live as Christ instead of encouragement feels rather like an intimidating standard that I don't necessarily meet up to. This next song that we're going to sing together, Complete in Thee, is my heart's prayer for this week moving forward as we get our hearts ready for worship that you're not called to nail these things on your own. We're called to find the sufficiency in Christ. Let's sing Complete in Thee. giving uh, as we've started our mortgage reduction. Uh, we are now at a total of $130,350 left on the loan, uh, which we are still continuing to, to uh, yeah, amen. So we thank you for that. Uh, we still have ways to go yet, and uh, we, we know that God will, will provide. So, um, so thinking this week on what to share, um, I really didn't have a lot of ideas um, prayed about it, said, Lord, I, I don't know what, what to talk about. And uh, oddly enough, <laughs> strangely enough, he said, I got this impression that instead of talking, we, we call this our mortgage minute. And, but instead of focusing on the mortgaging or the mortgage, uh, I'm going to focus on the minute. And so I'm reading for you Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 and explain what I'm talking about. Let's see then 
that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Uh, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord, Lord is. Uh, so the Bible encourages, especially uh, my references on verse 16, there are the three words, redeeming the time. Um, the Bible encourages here to redeem the time. To redeem means to gain or regain the possession of something in exchange for payment. Uh, we are working to redeem the funds that we are spending on, on this by paying that off. Um, uh, another thing we could call it could be regain, recover, reclaim. Um, there are many applications for this in our daily lives. We need to spend time, redeem the time spent worshiping and following God. Um, we need to redeem the time to spend with our family. We need to redeem time to spend with our church family. Uh, we lost a lot of that during 2020, it feels like. Um, these are all excellent things to redeem time for. For the mortgage, uh, we needed to redeem the time loss using the funds to repay the mortgage. Uh, we've already mentioned how we can use the budget of funds for missions, outreach, or other ministries. But I want to think, I want you to think about not just, well, this would be great to have the mortgage paid off. We could do a mortgage burning, all that stuff. But just think of the lives that we could use those funds for, how we could reach using that for other things, how we could redeem that time that we spent while paying off this mortgage to use for other things. Um, let us redeem that time and the funds to use for something more than paying off this loan. Please be in prayer about this and how else you can redeem your personal time for God and things that he tells us are important. We are so very busy and yet we need to redeem the time to lay up our treasures in heaven, not on earth. Thank you. Gentlemen, can go ahead and come for the offering this morning. Um, I have the privilege of having my sister and her family abstain with us this weekend, and um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to um, sing a song with her. And um, so, I, no matter what you're going through um, in your life right now, I hope this is a blessing to you. Um, why don't I go ahead and pray for the offering? Can I do that? <laughs> Let's pray together. God, we love you. We thank you for um, this morning. Um, that we can be here together in your house and um, just thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your provision in our lives and um, for this church body. Just pray that um, this morning would be an offering of praise to you and that you would be um, honored by our, our offering and tithes this morning as well. God, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify, name of all names. And nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Stand with me again. Um, one last time before we bring special music and the message. We're going to be looking today in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Um, and everything has been moved. There's more coming. Spoilers. Um, but that love, joy, peace in the midst of a lot in the recent time. That aspect of peace has been something that has been challenged. And so, it is well for my soul is the fruit of the Spirit that I want to sing this morning as a prayer for we request that the Lord can help me with as I move forward. Maybe it's where you find yourself. Let's sing together. It is well for my soul.
chapter 5. Thank you for that number, for the good singing this morning. And for your uh, relaxation this morning, uh, we have two sermons out of the last few verses, uh, so we're not going to try to do them all this morning, and that'll make some of you feel better. Um, we'll with Communion Sunday and trying to have time to focus and pay attention there, uh, we moved Communion from last week uh, because that would have fit great with the testimonies that were there uh, from camp. We appreciate so much what was shared and the work that the Lord did, um, but uh, didn't want you feeling like you were stressed uh, while you're supposed to be thanking God for what he's done for us. And so um, we made that adjustment. We have a special opportunity at the end of the service I just say this now to remind myself, so if I forget, you can remind me uh, that after we have the communion service and the offering, we're going to have a prayer dedication for the Noriegas. This is their last Sunday with us um, as residents of our area and uh, part of our church family here. Uh, they're beginning a ministry in Maryland, be moving next uh, weekend. 
out there, and um, we want to pray and uh, give. Some of you have um, dropped off cards and, and gifts for them. Uh, we'll give them to those today, but uh, some of you have already said this morning, I forgot. Bring it anyway, we'll get it to them. Somebody will know where they live. Um, we'll check with uh, their family here. I bet they'll track them down. Um, they're going to help them move. They'll, they'll, know, they'll know where they are, so we'll be all right. Um, but this morning, we want to look at two verses here that have to do with the uh, fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and it's a little bit different uh, kind of a, a passage and approach. We looked at the, at the negatives last time, things that the Bible is, says are wrong, and um, the grace of God that says we don't live under sin doesn't say, okay, so you get to sin. That's just not the way the Bible works. Um, things that are wrong are wrong. God doesn't really need to tell us again that they're wrong. Um, in fact, contrary to that, Paul says, hey, I already taught you these things were wrong before, so I don't, you know, I shouldn't even be making a point. But I'm making a point. There's the flesh that wars against the spirit, and the spirit does its work in your heart as a believer in Jesus Christ, and there's no laws against that. So that's what we're going to work, look at this morning out of two verses, beginning at verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity and the privilege we have to look into your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, encourage us, help us to understand um, what you have for us, and what the Spirit is doing in the lives of the believer. Um, we have the opportunity to allow you to do a work that is evident both in our hearts and in our lives as people observe it and in the way we go about the things that we do. And Father, uh, we just thank you for that. It is uh, our opportunity to uh, deal with our sinful flesh in a way that allows the Spirit of God to be glorified and do the work that points people to Jesus Christ and do the work that lifts up the glory of the Father. And Father, today we just uh, ask for that understanding of what you have for us in, in the Holy Spirit's work, and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The principle of the harvest that's mentioned here, there's a bunch of Greek words. This is going to be the last one that I actually use Greek letters for because, um, one, I have to keep changing the font on my computer, and that's not really that, that much of a thing. Uh, but karpos here is a, an idea that there is one fruit. Now, that doesn't mean there's just one hunk of thing hanging there. It means this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is what the Spirit does in a Christian's life. We look sometimes at the fruits of the Spirit because there's nine things here and we get all excited about And sometimes people say, pray and work on one of them at a time. Nobody wants to do that because eventually you'll get to patience. Nobody wants to go, I'm going to pray and work on patience. Yes. It is the trying of your faith that worketh patience. So everybody's like, yeah, not going there. Um, I'll, I'll work around patience. No, this is what the Spirit does. We don't work on these things. These aren't the things that the flesh produces. These are the things that the Spirit produces when the flesh gets out of the way. And so uh, the Greek for the idea of harvest is produce a particular crop. Now I've mentioned before that I grew up in a family of farmers. I don't know why that didn't pass on to me. I mostly am capable of killing things and weeding. Um, I'm, I am a fantastic weeder. Uh, making it grow, not so much. Pulling it, I'm in. Um, Paul gives us the harvest in the presence of the Spirit. Um, the Bible says when we receive Jesus Christ our Savior, we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God produces a harvest. My grandfather raised blueberries. Two of my uncles were blueberry farmers. We didn't go out during blueberry season, which is just coming to a wind down if you're still looking for, you pick blueberries, the rain and the stuff hasn't been helpful. Uh, but um, it's the season of blueberries, we didn't go out expecting to pick pears. We had a couple pear trees, but it was blueberry time. And we went and looked for blueberries and the bushes grow blueberries and there, it, there's blue stuff everywhere. And we picked them with harvesters. That was a, 
actually mowed the lawn of the guy who invented the giant harvester machines. Um, he worked for a company that didn't have anything to do with blueberries as an engineer, but he kept walking past blueberry fields, seeing all these people standing out there picking, went, there's got to be a mechanical way to get those berries. And he came up with the Harvey Harvester first, and then the big blue monsters, and um, there, there's lots of ways to pick blueberries. You, you, they're the best this way. Hand-picked and not all smashed and beaten and washed and frozen. And... But I know blueberries. I like blueberries. I also like lots of other things. But blueberry bushes produce blueberries. Strawberry plants produce strawberries. Corn plants produce corn. That's the way the harvest goes. The Spirit of God produces this fruit. That's what Paul's saying. If you have the Spirit of God, you get this stuff. If you don't have this stuff, examine yourself whether you be found in the faith. Because this stuff naturally produces in the life of the believer. And so we're going to look at it. Now, the, the interesting thing is, I broke it up into three groups and kind of how they apply. And that's our problem. I probably don't have a legitimate reason to separate it because you're all going to go, I'm going to work on these three, or he had this point, and these are the ones. The, the Holy Spirit does all of this in the life of every believer. He probably isn't doing it all at once, and we're not paying enough attention to get it all right at the same time, but um, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. If there's an area of this not taking place, it doesn't mean that you're not a believer, but it means that there's something between your soul and your Savior. Um, we have a lot of flesh. That's next time's sermon. Next week, we're going to have the Gideons here with us. They're going to share with us a particular um, burden of the spread of the gospel through the sharing of God's word. And uh, I always look forward to their presentations here. And um, they'll be here. I know they'll do a great job. But I have to wait for the next sermon that I have to preach. You don't know how hard that is for me. I get all cranked up and going to do one, going to get you the next one. And I, get, I have to go... <gasps> Okay, I told somebody this morning, we're going to preach on that next week. I'm not going to preach on that next week. I'm going to preach on it two weeks from now. But anyway, um, we're going to preach on this right now. And I've split these nine up into three points, into three sub points. That will look familiar to you. That's an that's a outline the way I was taught to do them in college. Okay. Sometimes I have to go, I don't know, that should probably be four points, but that doesn't fit my model. Um, this passage divides up real nice and they they work this way but there's a lot of overlap in between these categories and the the fruit of the spirit singular that god produces in our life looks like these things and it starts with love how's that is that surprising not so much love actually could be the way that you demonstrate all the things god is love all the things that god does he does from who he is and the bible says he is love is that the only way we know God? We know all of his attributes, but they're demonstrated in the love of Christ. They're demonstrated in the way he loves his creation, and he came to redeem his creation because he loved us. And so all of these fruits, which are singular, see how hard this message is for me? Uh, you have to keep saying the right thing. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness. It's all these things, but it is love. You ought to be able to look at biblical love as it's described here, the agape kind of love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, the agape kind of love that's different than the world loves, it's different than our romantic love, it's different than everything we talk about normally when we think about love. This is what Christianity looks like as we love the world because he first loved us. This is a world in which sometimes I don't feel very loving. This isn't a feeling kind of love. This is a self-sacrificing, I don't feel like it, I don't need to feel like it, I'm going to do it because it's what God does. And as God works in my life through the Holy Spirit, I'm going to love. You're going to love. God is going to do a work in you. They will know we are Christians by our love. Sometimes, I wonder 
if we didn't read that verse incorrectly and think they will know I am a Christian by my grumpy stand on stuff. I know I'm right, and I'm going to prove I'm right, and you're going to get right, and I'm going to be right, and we're going to... Like, are we moving the goal? Absolutely not. It's almost football season. Yeah, don't just get to move the goal. <laughs> you don't go, well, that's the goal, but that really looks tough. I'm thinking I'm just going to change it. Think uh, We're going to score our points at the 20. Not telling the other team, but they'll notice when they go up on the scoreboard. You don't get to do that. And I know a lot of Christians are like, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't like that part of it. I'm not really good at it. I'm not that kind of a person. I'm sorry, but if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, love is part of it. If it's not, get closer to the producer. There's something wrong with the product. We love. We speak the truth in. I know that I'm, even my enemies, I'm supposed to me in. Really, God? You have read the Gospels, right? Jesus and the way he dealt with people, the way he dealt with the Jews, the way he dealt with the Romans, the way he dealt with his disciples who were less than perfect. Does that mean we move the truth? No. He was very truthful. So truthful that some people chose because of his truthfulness to, to want to kill him. But it wasn't because he didn't love them. Christian love looks different. And Christian love is what's produced by the Spirit of God. It's not produced by the way we feel. It's not produced by our circumstances. It's not produced by people's attractiveness. Joy comes from the same root as grace, from the car word. It is grace-based joy. It's not based on our circumstances. It's based on the fact that God has demonstrated his grace toward us. In every circumstance, the Bible says the grace of God is sufficient for every trial. The grace of God is sufficient for every day. The grace of God is sufficient for everything I need for life and godliness. And so when I look at my life, and it may be a lousy life, it may be going through really hard times, there may, God may have just brought me all kinds of people who are not that encouraging. If I know Jesus Christ and I've experienced the grace of God, I have a reason for joy. You have a reason to be joyful. Not to be slap happy, <laughs> this is just wonderful, isn't it? Sometimes things are really bad. You can look around at the world today and go, things are really bad. But my hope is in the Lord. My reason for joy isn't my circumstance. My reason for joy is because Jesus Christ loved me so much that he gave himself for me and he guaranteed that this was temporary. And when I get over this, I've got great things. To look forward to and the peace of God which passes understanding Isaiah talks about how to overcome our fear the presence of the Lord is peace in karate which um, somebody, somebody lovingly asked me to do a karate demonstration before I'm done here you got to be out of your ever-loving mind. Um, my leg no longer goes above my head, and I, I might just smash something accidentally, but um, I, will, I will really have to contemplate whether there's any more kicks or punches left in this body. But uh, I think I could do something, and it, it would be horrible for months afterwards. So it probably not happening. I'll think about it just a tiny bit, and it'll probably not work. Um, but... Uh, in, in martial arts, there's a principle of mizu no kokoro, which is a mind like water. <laughs> Some of you are splashing around out there. Um, but uh, calm water reflects correctly what it sees. And troubled water doesn't. Uh, we live on a lake when there's perfect clarity. I usually get my camera out and take pictures of the reflections. It's so cool to see the sky reflected and the tr trees across the lake reflected. And everything just perfect. But if the wind's blowing and the waves are going... It looks like water, but it, nothing's reflected correctly. Some of us go through life, and we see ripples, and we see waves, and there's a problem coming, and 
calm down, take a deep breath, and trust God. Why? Because the Spirit wants to produce in you peace. Be anxious for nothing, but I am. There's all kinds of problems. You don't know what happened. I, I know. I agree with you. You have all the right in the world to be anxious and fearful, but the Bible wants you to trust God. And the opposite of being anxious is not don't be anxious. The verse doesn't say stop being anxious, just be okay. It says don't be anxious by everything through prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He didn't save you to leave you the way you are. He didn't save you to not care about your problems. He didn't save you so you can deal with this yourself. He called you to himself and put you in the body of Christ so that you don't face anything alone. The Holy Spirit wants to minister the peace of God which passes your understanding. If I rely on my own understanding, I have nothing but anxiety and fear. Because I don't think I can fix anything at all. There is absolutely nothing in me that goes, I got this. Because I know that when I have things perfectly nailed down, they don't usually go well at all. Let's send some outward actions after we get done with the inward spirit and we're experiencing love, joy, and peace. What does that look like? Long suffering. What? <laughs> I don't want that part. Especially when the meaning of this word has to do with putting up with other people, primarily. That's the kind of patience God is talking about. It's not just every circumstance. It's all the circumstances that are brought on by all the other people that God brought into our life. I don't know about you, but I have the most difficulty being patient with people. I stress out in the drive through lane. Even though they put up signs that say, we don't have enough people working in here. Be patient. We're doing the best we can. I'm like, but I saw the two of you who are in there standing still for a minute. I'm in my car. You know, I'm paying for gas here. I've got stuff to do. And besides that, I'm here because I'm hungry. I don't know if you know about the word hangry. When you take hungry and anger and you shove them together in one person. Um, I get that pretty quick. Uh, it's like, oh, um, come on, let's eat something. I don't uh, I don't even care. There's a piece of candy in my pocket now just in case this doesn't go well. Um, God says, hey, the Holy Spirit produces a love for other people that just makes you able to put up with it. Why would Paul write that to the Galatian believers who are having all kinds of issues in their church? Some of the people may not even be saved there. Some of the people are trying to destroy the faith of others. Paul says, rip into them, let them have it. They got it coming. No, he says, hey, just be patient. Exercise a little long suffering. It will be good for you. My spirit will be producing the endurance you need to make it through this without sinning. He does that at home too, by the way. Just want to throw that out there. Kindness, Christosis, sounds a lot like Christos, which is Christ. In fact, um, some of the commentaries suggest that people had trouble distinguishing for Christians, whether when they were called Christians, whether people with an accent were saying they were good. Is that a terrible thing to have said about us? They were saying they were like Christ, but some people thought, they're saying they're good. It sounded like that in Greek. I wish it always sounded like that in English. I know that person, they're a Christian. Oh, yeah, they're great. They're good. They just do the right thing. They are good to other people. What did the Bible say about Jesus, our example? He went about doing good. He saw needs, he went about and met them. He saw people who were poorer than him. He saw that their needs were met. He saw people with physical needs. He saw that their needs were met. Christians are supposed to be kind. Again, it's, it's much easier to judge people and be harsh, but the Bible says that the Spirit of God produces in us a long-suffering 
patience with people and a goodness toward their needs. The next word is goodness, and you go, wait, you just said goodness twice in a row. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if Christians were called goody goods? You're just so good. You're, you're just like good and good. Um, this kind of goodness is, is a generosity. Again, I'm not sure sometimes that Paul looked at the modern church. Modern church sounds like we're not generous, we're needy. You claim what you need from God. You claim what you're going to get. You claim what you're going to have. You, if, you, if you follow God, you get stuff. The Bible says the Holy Spirit works in you. You give stuff. You're not here for you. You're not here for your gain. You're not here for your own. You're here to be a blessing and to give to other people. I get the saying, a, is a giving heart. It's somebody who just wants to see what's needed. Again, there are so many needs in the world that can seem overwhelming. I have a really hard time when I watch specials where they show the great needs in some country. I have a really hard time when I go uh, on mission trips to foreign countries where they're much poorer than us. But those experiences have been very good for me because it reminds me, one, to be grateful for what I have, and two, to remember that I don't have it just so I can do stuff for myself or even for the people that I care about. God wants us to care more and to do more in a world that needs more, and he's blessed us with stuff. Very easy in our consumer society to say we could need more when the Bible says we could do more if the Spirit was working in our hearts in that direction. They run out of battery because I'm having to double click some of these. There we go. Whoop! Not too much. There we go. Um, so we have inward qualities, we have outward actions, and the last three kind of reflect what a person is like while he's doing these things. One is to have faith. Pistis in the Greek, and it can mean both faith in God and being faithful toward other people. Faith demonstrated. We talked about faith in Sunday school class. Faith, the Bible says, is when we take what we believe and we put it into action, what we're trusting is demonstrated. We deal with things in a way that is faithful toward God. I'm going to do things because I believe God is at work. I'm going to trust him to do this because I believe what God has said in his word. I'm going to work with the people of God and be patient with them and then allow God to work in their hearts and it's not going to be about me and what I want and what I have to have. It's going to be about seeing God use me in that person's life to accomplish his will in the long run. Faith. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you believe he saved you for a reason. It was interesting, a few years back, a pastor in California wrote a book on having purpose for life. I don't know how many Christians thought they had no purpose, but I was amazed at how people went, hey, according to this book, I have a reason for being here. Okay, it was a pretty good book. According to this book, we have a purpose for being here. God created us for a purpose. He saved us for a purpose. It, it sometimes is amazing that, that we get as enamored with people and what they do with the Word of God and less excited about what God has said. I hope you have a verse for why you're going to do things because I hope you believe God. I feel God wants me to do this. Why? I just get this warm, fuzzy feeling. Okay. I got that yesterday. It's actually cool enough that I put on a sweater. Uh, I, I love when it cools off. Oh, t oh, for this guy to need a sweater. I may have been running my air conditioning when it was still cool. But anyway, I got out a sweater. And I put it on, it was warm and fuzzy. I hope you have a bigger heart for the things of God. And as soon as I feel it, you know, as soon as, God, as soon as you believe God, it's a good time to act. Let the warm and fuzzies come later.
Obedience is a cool thing. It's a, it's a good thing to say, thus saith the Lord. I got a verse for what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share the gospel. Why? Oh, because I just, I'm really feeling like it's, how about go into all the world and preach the gospel? You believe God? Let's give it a shot. It's, it, it's a good idea. Gentleness, prootis, humility. How do you deal with people? Gentleness comes because they don't have to do what you say. You just want the best for them. We have to remember in the day in which we live and people disagree with us, um, if you follow the Bible, the world will oppose you. Why do I know that? Because it opposed him. And the Bible says we're not better than our teacher. They'll say, well, if you just do it right, you know, you really won't upset people. I think Jesus nailed it and they nailed him. Okay? So there's no way to be truthful in a sinful world and have people okay with it. But you don't have to be a pain in the neck. You really don't. You can be nice to people. You can say, I'm going to serve you even though I totally disagree with you. I'm going to approach you in a gentle way because I want you to get this. And I want you to get it right, and I'd love to be the one to share it with you. When I was younger, someone very graciously and wisely pulled me aside and said, you know, you're really stressed out all the time about whether people agree with you or not. I said, I don't think I am. He said, no, you are. You're, you really are. You're very stressed out all the time about whether people get it right and, and you've got to fix it. He said, how about you let God fix it? You just worry about you. I quite often get asked by other pastors, how do you stay at a church so long? You are God's church. I get to love you I get to teach you. Thank God I don't have to fix you. I believe that the power of God and the Spirit of God and the Word of God are adequate for the work of God. And that is not on me. So I can just teach and trust. The last one is self control. One is toward God, faith. How you deal with people believing in God. One is gentleness, it's humility. It's not about you, it's about him. And the last one is self-control. This is about you. (laughs) This is where all the fruit of the Spirit works in your heart to where you begin to say no to the flesh and yes to the things of God. And that's the next sermon about the conflict between the flesh and the Spirit. Self-control, according to Paul, you know how you deal with the self? You discipline that baby. You do. Paul says, I keep my body under you. Know how he did that? Crucify the flesh. Dead stuff doesn't really cause much trouble. If you see yourself dead to sin but alive to God, Romans chapter 6, sin's going to come along and tempt you. You're going to be, nah, can't, couldn't pull that off if I tried. I'm dead. I have no interest in doing that sin anymore. Some of us, actually all of us read a Bible, um, have a sin problem. Before I was saved, I loved sin. Planned my day around it. I had to get out of my house to pull it off. Parents didn't allow most things that I wanted to do. In my like, I have got to get out of here. It's kind of like a prison break. Um, where, where can I say I'm going? What can I say I'm doing? Because lying is a sin, but it's you know, when you're going to go sin, it really doesn't matter if you just tack one on. Um, plotting to do wrong all the time. The spirit of God comes in. I still know what sin is, and there's pleasure in sin for a season, but 
the Spirit of God begins to work, and you start to go, nah, I don't want to do that. Nah, that's not worth the price. Nah, I'm not going to tack out another sin to go, to, that's dumb. I've got all this good stuff to do. <laughs> there are people who need me to help them. There are people who need, there's a God to glorify. I'm actually too busy to, to even be as dumb as I used to be. I mean, that just, that's a great place to get. I'm, I just have too much of the Spirit of God working in me to have any time to feed the flesh. Until you get there, you've got to exercise some self-control. And since I don't think you ever really get there, you need to exercise some self-control. Because I thought I'd succeeded in a Christian college environment when I wasn't drunk every weekend. Like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. There's more to Christianity than that minor accomplishment. Oh, I haven't purchased anything illegal for a while. There's a higher goal than that in life, actually. You can do better than just, I haven't broken any laws recently. Um, I hope the Spirit of God is producing in you the life of God to where you're able to go, oh, I still got that to work on. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It's all of Him. It's not of you. You're not doing it in the flesh. But when you get to crunch time, you're the only one who says no to you. The Spirit of God can chasten you if you're blowing it. Do you really want God to have to slap you in the head? I have found that that is not where I want to be in my relationship with my Heavenly Father. Occasionally, are we still filming? I won't say that you're supposed to slap your kid in the head, but um, occasionally, children need correction from a loving father. And the Bible says our Heavenly Father will Chasing us. He's not going to go, yeah, I don't care if you sin. Go ahead. Just, you could destroy people in your own life. And you, you know, but, you know, I really know you're having a bad day and things aren't going your way. So, you know, your rotten attitude and your terrible behavior is fine with me. That's not the way this works. He goes, no, hey, get your act together, son. You're a child of mine. I can still hear my dad's voice. You know, he's been with the Lord for a long time, saying, hey, as long as you're my son, you're not going to pull that. That was just like sleeping in and being lazy. <laughs> that was all that was necessary in my house. It was like, hey, not in my house. Our Heavenly Father goes, hey, I've got such wonderful things for you. Don't do dumb stuff. Say no to sin. How do I know what I'm to say no to? There's a whole list of it we looked at. These things do not belong in the life of the Christian. Start there. These things, the Bible actually says, there is no law against walking in the Spirit. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that it's bad to be long-suffering, that it's bad to be self-controlled, that it's bad to be gentle with people, that it's bad to be... The flesh is the issue that we're dealing with. And the way we deal with that is by the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus came in order that he might give himself a sacrifice for our sins, that we might know him. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have the opportunity and the privilege to remember what he's done for you and to do that with the family of God. And the Bible says we're to do that as often as we do it in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. We will invite you now, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're seeking to follow him as in obedience in your life as Lord, that you join us in remembering what he's done for us.